All right, how's everybody doing? Perfect. All right, well, our next speaker is going to razzle-dazzle and amaze you guys. He's going to wow you guys. You're going to have no idea what's going to be happening. I know you have a full seat, but you're only going to need the edge. So if I get a nice big round of applause for Nick Scott. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be kind of hard to follow that one up, but uh, still, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm Nick, um, uh, and this is going to be about the Nagios Network Analyzer, and it's also going to be about the Nagios SNMP Trap Interface, both of which are like newish, newer projects. Uh, the Nagios Network Analyzer is going to be a new one. It's going to be geared more towards enterprise. It's not, it's not open source, um, but I'm still going to talk about it, show you what it can do. Um, I'll talk about um, NetFlow a little bit. If you guys don't aren't familiar with NetFlow, we'll just kind of get everybody on the same page there. Um, and then I'll talk about the features and, and all the good stuff about NSTI as well. So we're going to start out with Nagios uh, Network Analyzer, and then we'll just go from there. Um, so let's see. Yes, that's right. I do have slides. I should probably be sticking to those. Um, so let's just jump into it here. Um, Nagios Network Analyzer is built to analyze like NetFlows. Um, and is there anybody here who is currently using NetFlow in their environment? Um, so you, you, you can speak to how, how good and useful and how much better of a picture that you get when you are using NetFlow. Um, one of the bad things about NetFlow is that uh, it's so much data. Like, um, I'm going to talk about what actual, like, the data it is, but you just get buried in the data. And that's kind of one of the biggest problems. Um, but NetFlow is, um, let's see, it was it started... Cisco, Cisco started the whole NetFlow thing like back in like the 90s, I think like 1990 to be exact. Um, and what it does is it starts tracking like actual sessions of what's happening. That, that, that's not a very good explanation. Like every time there's a connection that's got all of these, uh, these things in common, like you have some connection that's on the same interface of a router that's starting at this IP and going to this IP um, using a certain IP protocol that's um, starting at this port and going to this destination port, NetFlow um, just rolls that all together, and that's what's considered a flow to NetFlow. Now, that's fungible, and there's some people who might argue that there's, like, there's a little more to it than that, but when you get down to the base, base of it, that's what Cisco started calling a NetFlow, and that's just kind of like where it, where it kept going afterwards. So... What does that all mean? Well, we'll get into what, what, what that means. I'm just bringing, bringing up to speed on some, some terminology of like what, what, what an actual flow is. Um, let's see here. So like what actually can define these flows or what can send these flows? Um, uh, traditionally, it was a router um, that define these flows and then export these flows to some, some NetFlow collector. Um, but, but nowadays there's, switch, the, there's switches that do have NetFlow capability, so um, you, can, you can use that to export NetFlow data. Um, there is software, that you, so you can install some sort of like a F-probe is what I commonly use um, on like a server of yours to actually get the NetFlow style data from that server. Um, and that actually exports to a central, like, NetFlow analyzer, and that's the role that Network Analyzer is looking, looking to fill. Um, so that's kind of the, the anatomy of how you get NetFlow built into your network. Um, and, and basically what, the, um, what these do, like, as the router is routing all of the... Um, all of the packets that are coming through, it's composing these flows and it's storing them in its cache. And, what's, and what it traditionally does is it, is it comes into the router and then it disseminates that information, collects it, and then as soon as, as the cache on this router fills up, it sends it out to, to the actual network analyzer. Um, so it, you can have it dump its cache so that you can get like pretty much like synchronous data as it's going through through the router instead of saying have to fill the uh, router up. But that's um, as far as I know, that's not a general use case. Um, and then as far as, as what this does is this um, uh, so something like this, where it's something like FProbe, where you, that you'd install on your server to actually garner NetFlow data, um, it just actually puts the NIC in promiscuous mode, and then um, that's kind of how it. It just looks at everything on the uh, actual collision domain of, of the NIC and then exports that as well. 
Um, there's, um, there's a couple different types of NetFlow. Um, Nagios Network Analyzer supports all of them. Uh, there's, there's NetFlow version 5, 7, and 9. Um, primary differences are, I believe, 5 only supports IPv4. Um, same with 7. Um, version 9 supports IPv6. Um, Nagios Network Analyzer supports version 9. There's IP, IP, IP fix, which is version 10, um, which is also supported by Network Analyzer. And then um, there's the actual other, other brands of, of NetFlow, like JFlow which I do believe, I have not tested this, I don't have a Juniper router to use or to test with, but I do believe that that is uh, pretty much a, just a bit-for-bit bit copy of NetFlow. Um, if, if, if anybody knows differently, please speak to me after this talk, because then we'll need to talk. Um, and then th there's also something called SFlow, which is actually really popular, and it is actually really cool. Um, SFlow, as far as I know, stands for sampled flow, um, and while NetFlow, generally like grabs every single packet and like does its does its netflow analyzation to to see where the like the source port destination port destination ip source ip all that stuff and stores it sflow just samples packets so in much higher volume networks um netflow can become uh you just have so much data and it's filling up so fast but if you just kind of want to get a sample like you want to get every 500th packet obviously you're not getting the same resolution of what at, what's actually happening on your network, but odds are you're going to get like a similar picture. It just won't be; it'll just be like a five hundredth of the of the resolution, if that analogy works. Um, all right. So, uh, what are some common use cases of NetFlow? Like, so the now that we kind of know what NetFlow is and like what it does, it pertains to networks, I guess, is what we've established. Um, some common some common use cases are bandwidth usage. Because like currently, w when you're looking at bandwidth and you're l looking to see uh, what's using up all the bandwidth, um, if, if you're not using NetFlow, pretty much the best thing you can do is you just look at the router and then you know what that's connected to, and then or you look at the like the the SNMP pollings on a switch of like in and out bandwidth, and you know what's hooked up to the switch, so you know that something hooked up to that switch is using a lot of bandwidth, bandwidth, but you really have no idea beyond that. You can go and you can go and look at the like the server that it's hooked up to or you be like, oh yeah, that's that's that that's marketing or something. I, I I don't know how how else you would do it, but um, NetFlow actually really just completely fixes that 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 problem. You can you can see bandwidth with like per port, and by that I mean you can see how much bandwidth is flowing through port 80 on like going to a certain IP or from a certain IP um, IP or subnet. Um, it's you can, can you can control it that way as well, um, like w where it's going and like any combination of the above, which which we'll get into later. Um, I, d I don't have a live demo of Network Analyzer just because of the implicit environment that is almost required to have some sort of network analyzer like a NetFlow analyzer because you have to have so many things that are sending it data for it to actually be interesting or useful. Um, uh, and then s some other common use cases are kind of an extension of the of the bandwidth usage would be like a barren activity. Um, and up here I've got like watch for known worm virus activity, which is actually kind of a funny story. When I first um, was first starting to get into the NetFlow, Ethan was like, just go figure out and just try and try and figure out wh whatever you can about this. Um, I got I, I got a I got a NetFlow collector working, and then I looked at the bandwidth. And there was a lot of bandwidth coming. Um, I can't remember what port it was, but it was a uh, it was a port that was a known uh, Trojan port. And I was like, "Oh, Ethan, um, I think." And we had just hired a new guy, uh, Scott Scott Wilkerson. And uh, I think I think Scott's got a virus. So, um, and we were like, "Oh, oh crap!" And so we had him run all of this antivirus uh, stuff, and it just turned out that it would, he had was using a strange port for Dropbox. So um, kind of felt silly after that, but anyways, um, it, it, it was it did still kind of uh, show the like oh hey look it might be a virus but it wasn't a virus so um, so uh, the actual challenges of NetFlow is that you get a lot of data and it's very easy to get buried and sometimes people will say the only thing worse than no data is too much data. Um, I don't even know what too much data means, but I can certainly understand the feeling that too much data is a bad thing if you don't know how to go through it properly. Um, you also need a good way to drill down through all the data, which um, kind of goes hand in hand with the easy to get buried. 
Um, and visualizations would be nice because while it's real, a lot of fun looking at numbers, um, not all of us are at like that matrix level where we just see blonde, brunette, redhead when it's, when it's going through the network. Um, it's, the other thing is it's really easy to oversimplify stuff um, if, when, when there's easy ways to drill down. Um, and, that's, and that's one thing I tried to keep an eye to with, with Network Analyzer was just maintaining the actual flexibility. Um, because Nagios Network Analyzer uses, um, well actually I'll get into that in the slide in the li in later. Um, and as far as like computationally expensive, it does get very computationally expensive because it does keep all of this data on the hard disk. Um, and that's kind of unavoidable. You have to have this store of data and it's got to go back for at least a while and you've got to have a good way to filter through it and get the actual information you want. So um, it, it, what couldn't, couldn't really be implemented in um, you know, like a nice to write with language like um, Python directly or, or Perl. Um, so I just kind of had to implement that in a lower level language. Which um, if, if you guys do like using lower level languages, um, just n apropos of nothing, but Cython is actually really cool and it's really fast. Okay, um, so just kind of getting more, m more to the point here, what is Nagios Network Analyzer? Um, uh, it basically captures the incoming NetFlow data. I'm actually gonna skip ahead to this slide here. Um, Nagios NetFlow Analyzer uh, takes advantage of NFCAPD, uh, which is an open source uh, project, and that actually listens for the NetFlow data. So, so you've got some router that is that, that's sending NetFlow data, and it's being caught by NFCAPD. And NFCAPD's only job is to write this to some to some data store, and this. And this data store um, is, is a proprietary database. Um, I didn't dig into it too far how it's set up, but it is, um, it's, it's actually very fast with access times when, when hooked up with NFDump, which um, uh, if, if you guys have used TCP dump, it's very similar to TCP dump. You just, it's just that this NFDump just, just references this actual, this actual d data store here. And where Network Analyzer comes in is it is a front end that uses NFDump and it just uh, just makes it a lot easier to go through your NetFlow data and uh, like set up Nagios checks, um, reports, visualizations, um, a lot of stuff like that, which which is nice for, for the user, and you don't have to do anything on the on the command line or or, or anything like that. So, um, so basically. We have this, th this idea of sources, and a source is any router that's actually sending NetFlow information. Um, and, and what happens is you create a source in, in Nagios Network Analyzer, and then Nagios Network Analyzer creates an RRD for general I.O., um, and, and by that I mean um, it sums the, the amount of in and out bytes per second, um, amount of flows based on TCP, UDP, ICMP, all of the protocols that, that, that it's actually watching. Um, and then also, it, it creates RRDs for uh, user-specific user queries. And by that I mean, um, if you wanna see what's happening on port 80 on this source, um, this, this will actually create the RRD that's, that's keeping track of the information of what's going through port 80. Like, um, and I'm talking bandwidth. I, I'm not talking like the entire NetFlow data, just the, just the general summary for it, so that it's uh, nicer to graph, it's easier to it's, it's easier to work with on a general level and to use later for when you're um, actually creating a, um, a NetFlow query. Um, and let's see, and then, then there's also groupings. Because um, while having like indiv all of this stuff for, for individual sources is nice, um, in larger environments I would think that would get a little unwieldy. So um, you can logically group, to group together sources and then it just, you, you can treat them as one source. So if you've got like four border routers, you can just group them together as one, as one and then just, just run the same net NetFlow queries and it's just completely transparent to, to the actual user. Um, so, that's, so, so that's the terminology there. Um, then the other things that, that we were going for with Network Analyzer was the actual data dissemination. Um, and we had to make some, some distinctions like reports, like top talkers. Um, for instance, like if you want to see the top talkers going across your network, um, that's that I, I was trying to treat them as the same for a long time, but they're actually they're actually quite quite different. Um, a report is just going to aggregate the total. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm actually going to talk about this stuff during the video demonstration so that we don't take as much temp space up in the, up in the brain here. All right. Um, so, so this is um, this is like the th this is the source page um, where we're seeing all of the sources that, that we have. Um, and, and right here, I only have two sources. I've got our Office Backbone, uh, which is a, an HP switch that we were using that's got SFlow enabled on it. Um, and it just kind of gives you it just g gives you a heads up of what the actual total traffic is. This isn't much better than um, like say if you had like an SNMP polling on, on this on this interface or every single interface being summed together. Um, for for all of these, and it just gives you uh, what the what the last uh, five minute status was for the actual switch. Um, and then here, like if we actually click on a source to drill down, like we we clicked on Office Backbone, and we want to see what's actually going on. It brings us to a graph that makes it a little easier to drill down. It gives us the uh, actual top talkers by source IP. Um, so like uh, these these three were actually the had, had the most had the most bytes per second in the past in the past five minutes, um, and then this was based on destination IP. So there was a lot of bandwidth coming from 107.222.194.190, and there was a lot of bandwidth going here. Um, and, and if you click on any of these, it'll be, it'll bring you to an actual query that'll that'll actually show you this this information. And then if you click on this, it'll bring you to the actual top talker report, which we'll go to later. Um, so maybe I jumped ahead of it here. Yeah. So so all, all all of these are all of these are clickable, and um, then as we go here, then this actually uses um, takes advantage of high charts. I don't know if you guys ever ever use it. It's a fantastic JavaScript graphing library. Um, but here, I'll just kind of try and explain what's going what what some of the stuff on the page is. Um, this is an actual graph of all the of all the bandwidth that's been going through, and this blue is the actual totals of what was going through. So this so this blue you see is what the actual um, total throughput on this source was, and then it's kind of grouped into th these are these are two user definable um, queries. So like the file transfers, I do believe were um, port 22, port um, the RDP port the I'm I'm sorry the um, like the SNM SMB port, and then um, uh, there's I think FTP, and so I I, I don't know how, how well you can see it, but um, th these these spikes of green are bandwidth are like how much bandwidth that all of those were actually taking up as well. So it's kind of easy to spot. Like you, d you can't see a whole lot of green. There's some here. You can see some behind this here. You can see one here. But otherwise, it just kind of it just kind of sp just spiked in those areas. So that might be somewhat interesting. And then web server traffic, which was just port 80 and port 443. Um, so it does it, it does break it down by all of that. Um, and then as far as like getting the top talkers, the drop down, you can pick source IP, destination IP, all of that stuff that was also over here, just kind of another spot to actually access that data. Um, so it, it, on the mouse overs, it'll actually show that. And then on selection, you can select like a certain area that you'd like to see something. Like if you, like if there was reports of, of um, the internet being slow, which is probably the worst thing. Uh, network admin can hear because A, it means something was bad, and B, it doesn't tell them anything about what was bad. Um, you can actually drill down to see what was taking, possibly taking up bandwidth at that point. Um, and so, the, so then here we see, like, before it was on a three-day view, I believe, and now this was on, so, so now it's three hours. So here we, we see a big breakdown. Like, well, obviously, the web server is taking up most of the traffic a lot of the time. It seems to be going off and on, though. Um, so if we drill down even further, we can kind of see what the what the traffic traffic was there. And now, um, what it's going to do is it took this actual time frame that we drilled down to this approximately two to approximately 240. And I believe the person who's making this video, which was myself, uh, is going to click this execute button. And what that's going to do is it's going to get the top talkers based on source IP um, across this like th this actual time frame. Right here. Say, go ahead and click it. All right. So then, what what that does is it brings us to an actually a, a new page 
uh, which is the reports page. And so this is something we've already seen. Um, but up here is where you actually define so some of the other things, like the top end type, which you know is obviously like source IP. And then we, we want it to be ordered by bytes. And we want the top 20 of them. Um, and then this is just a named report, which would you, so you, you, you can mess with these as much as you want. You just kind of change, like if you want the top 10 or the top 15, or you want it by destination, and then order it by flows instead of bytes, or uh, packets instead of bytes, and then save it. You can save it for named reports and then load it later. But if we scroll down, um, it actually gets us to kind of where the, like, the drill down spot. So here is kind of where the crux of everything is. Like it's definitely not the prettiest, but it does tell you a lot of inf information about what was going on in your network. Um, you know, like wh wh what time the actual flow started. Um, b before I was talking about flows where it's just like a session um, where those seven characteristics were all, were all the same and they didn't change. So like destination IPs, destination port, protocol, interface, and then source IP and source um, port. And so it just keeps track so that there was this here and there was this many like individual micro flows between them because they do get cut up but the, they are still recognized with the same flow ID. Um, and what, what the percent of the total was, how many packets there were, how many bytes there were. Um, but you'll notice it doesn't really tell you anything about like what the port, what the port was or what any of the destination IP was or anything like that. That's not what this page is about. This is just for telling you what, where the most data was originating from. Um, and y y you can download, download this as a CSV if you want to, you know, to put into your Excel data, do whatever you want with it. And so then moving up here, um, th there's actually a, like a, a pie chart that's rolled into it. It's kind of, you know, makes it easy to see that that uh, one of those was consuming way more data than the others. And now what we did was we just changed it to the top 10 talkers. Uh, makes the pie chart a little easier to read because there's not, it's not trying to cram 20 of them on there. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, we still do see that the top, uh, get, a, get an idea of how much bandwidth the top talker was actually using in relation to everybody else. And now, and now what we're gonna do here is this, th this actually just trimmed it down to 10. So, so all these numbers are gonna change, but but, uh, but th th this column is actually clickable so that instead of just knowing that that was the actual um, top consumer of bandwidth, if we click on it, um, it's gonna create a query. Um, and once again, it does stay within the end dates uh, where the, and it's just gonna give us a query where the source IP was this, which was the, which was the, uh, the actual top talker there. And then there's a source, I and it's gonna aggregate by source IP and destination IP. So the only fields that it's actually gonna fill and connect with, it's gonna find all of the, all of the unique source IP to destination IPs and group them together uh, where the source IP is that. Um, and, this, and this NetFlow query, the, this is where the TCP dump style syntax comes in. So if we, if we scroll down here, we, we, we get to see that, get to see that graph again. Um, but where the crux of it is, is now we actually see, um, so this is the source IP and it's going here. Um, so, oh, so this is, and how much bandwidth was it taking? This one was actually taking up quite a bit of the bandwidth as, as you can see. Um, uh, most of it, actually. Um, and if we want more information, we can click on the actual source port column. And so now it'll actually fill it out um, where before the, the actual dot three one was, was, was taking it all. And, it, and now it, it grabs all of the unique the source IPs, destination IPs, and source ports. And it, 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 it combines them if they're all the same and adds up the actual packets and bytes. And then if we click the destination port, it'll add that to the actual query as well. So now we, do, we can see where all of those went to. So it's, it's kind of designed to make it so that you can just see what's consuming the most. Or if you want, you can put a filter in and grab the actual information you want. And it, um, this actually does do DNS lookups too. So while I'm using source IP um, and naming a, a specific IP, you could type in source host and www.facebook.com or, or something like that, and I'll actually do the DNS resolutions and query the actual NetFlow data that you have for, for that. Um, 
and then if like you actually click on a column rather than a clickable row, it'll just it'll show you what all of the information is just for that column. All right, so that's the end of that video. Hooray. Now we can talk about some other stuff. All right, um, the other thing that's important, so we do, we've done the data drill down. Um, now what we need is we don't really even want to have to look at the data because that's kind of secondary. It's, it's nice, but if you're having to look at all the stuff, I mean, that's just more stuff that, that you have to look at. Um, so the approach was when doing notifications for this is um, uh, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel um, because Nagios is obviously has pretty much every every nook and cranny of what you could possibly want for notifications kind of done already. So I, I didn't want to re-implement Nagios like um, don't don't notify me unless it's been critical for five checks in a row. Like I, so I, I I didn't do that. It's just it's just simple email notifications for every time that, that, that there's a notification down. But the big thing is, is that it's got pretty tight integration in, uh, into Nagios. Um, you can, so, and, and it's got built-in NRDP and NSCA. Um, and it's got no automated Nagios XI integration, which I will show a video of. Um, and then along the way, that should also spell out how it actually integrates with, with Nagios as well. Um, so another video here. Okay, so here we are in the Nagios XI interface. Um, I don't know how many of you guys actually use XI, but um, it's, it's gonna be very similar to core. Um, and what I'm showing here is that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight services on, on the Nagios XI box right now. Um, and so what I, what I did is I wrote a component for XI um, that is the network analyzer component. And it basically uses an access control list. And this was my actual, um, Nagios Network Analyzer instance, the .194, and I just put, I just, I just made sure that that was on there. And so now I'm going to Nagios Network Analyzer, and we have no checks running, um, and then this is our sources and our groups. Um, and then if we go to configure, <laughs> um, and then we, uh, we wanna add a new Nagios server. So now once again, th this will be the same for both Core and XI. Just in core, you'll have to put in a little more information. Uh, so we want to add one, and thankfully, I'll just use the drop down so I don't, you guys can't see how bad I am at typing when I actually have to be good at it. Uh, but as far as the, you can pick NRDP, which is which it defaults to, or NSCA, you just need to specify the port. But if you leave it at NRDP, um, it will attempt to query your Nagio server for the NRDP token. So if we click save. and then go back into it. Um, uh, it's obviously queried the actual NRDP token that the uh, Nagios XI server is using. So onward, that looks like that, that works. Um, and then what, what I did here is I simply clicked on, on checks, which we have none running right now, but if we just go to add a new check, um, and then that, that actually brings us to this add a new check screen, which I'll let it run for a little while. We need a name, um, and then the actual source. This is like um, uh, if if you've got like a, um, you, you've got a location in Dallas, you've got a location in San Francisco, and then you've got a location in Rio de Janeiro. Um, if like you just want to do it against the one in Dallas, or if you just want to do it against the one in Rio, um, that's where you, you'd specify it here. Or if you want to do them, uh, do them against all three, you'd have to put them into a grouping, which would also uh, show up in this drop down. Um, and then you, you pick your contacts. And then this is kind of where the, like the terminology gets a little fuzzy. Like I didn't really know what to call it. Like the metric is actually like bytes per second. So if this check, um, which, which we're gonna specify d down here, um, has like returns a value of 1,000 bytes per second or 2,000, it'll return warning and critical respectively. And then this is where it actually kind of gets into being interesting as far as, as, far as NetFlow goes. Um, we're gonna make, and this can get pretty much as complicated as you want. Um, we're gonna make like a atomic component. So there's gonna be a network object, which is which I think I'm gonna pick source port. So if the, if the source port is 80, let's see. 
and then you, you, you can decide, I just went ahead and added a, a, another uh, network component. So if that's 80, and then you can just keep adding them, and uh, it, it, it does get a little hairy with the and or logic, like you want this group to be or together and this group anded together. So I, I, I made these and group numbers, and there's, um, there's, there's four groups, and it'll go through and it'll grab them by the group. It'll, it'll and all of the things in the same group number together, and then, it'll, and then it will or all of those, all of the resulting and functions together. I think I kept it somewhat simple here. So if the source port is 80, um, or the oh, and the destination port is is 80, <laughs> so we're we're not going to get much traffic here. But then uh, we want to add a service. This this Anagio server that, that we made um, in the in, in the admin before, um, with the service name new new demonstration check on the host local host. Then we'll save that, and then we see it's showing up here in the actual admin, and we see it's showing up here now in the actual um, Nagios network analyzer interface. Um, and then in XI, it just went ahead and it contacted the server, um, told it, hey, make this, make this new service on this host, and that's exactly what, and then it will apply the configuration, and that's exactly what it did. Um, so now this should start getting data um, every, every every five minutes or whenever you have the actual job run, and that's the that's the Nagios integration. The uh, core integration isn't quite as tight. You have to you, you'd have to have some sort of script that could be somewhat easily modified from the actual component, which is something that I'll probably be working on next um, to actually add the interface. So. Um, do believe that was everything I wanted to talk about with network analyzer. Um, and so the next topic is going to be NSTI. Um, was there any questions or anything? I, I know this isn't the time for questions, but um, before moving on to NSTI. All right. Oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, all right, so now uh, NSTI, um, everybody's got SNMP traps. Everybody loves working with them, I, I presume. I mean, from the, my general consensus is just, they're, they're just so easy to use. Um, you know, I, I, I just, okay, <laughs> I, I, I can't even make that, make that sound realistic at all. So um, basically, now what I'm gonna go do, we're gonna kinda switch modes here. Oh. Um, we're going to go and we're going to, we're actually going to go into live demo mode. I don't have videos of this, so I'm, if you'll just excuse me for one moment while I get my server started. All right. All right, so this is NSTI. <laughs> no, it is not. All right, this is, is NSTI. Um, I'm, I'm already logged in. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are currently using NSTI or not, um, but NSTI was a fork of Nagtrap that I, that I just kind of did last year just because there were some features that, that I wanted added. Um, but then um, I started using Django, and I really like Python. Um, so I decided, hey, um, I'm writing all this stuff for Nagios Network Analyzer. Uh, a lot of it is kind of the same idea if you think about it. Like you just want something that, um, that sorts through all this data and notifies Nagios about it so that you can kind of roll it into your whole Nagios scheme. Um, so NSTI is, is open source. Um, uh, you know, if like you guys want to use it for your own purposes, go ahead, use it for your own purposes. It's free. Um, you just download it. If you guys want to uh, push patches back, that's, that, that's cool too. If not, I, that's fine with me. But I'll just uh, go into the functionality of it though. So it, like this, this is just logged in. We're logged in as me. Um, and uh, it just kind of dumps you to all the traps. Now this is pretty standard. It's, um, it's, it's using SNMPTT as the back end for it. Um, and SNMPTT is just dumping all the traps that it gets into into a MySQL database. Um, I did change 
the SNMP PT SQL uh, tables because they were just dumping the actual time received as a string, um, which is kind of tough to sort. Um, and MySQL has a date time object, so upon using this, you will have to you will have to do some um, you will have to update your actual database tables. It's not it's not difficult. There's a SQL file that's that that will do that for you, so you don't have to worry about losing all of your your previous traps. But it just kind of gives you a heads up, um, uh, like whether it's been marked red or not. I did try and carry over a lot of the functionality from NSPI into this. What the trap OID was, um, the host name, the time it was received, event names, um, and I'm just I'm just using a script to do this on my dev box. So all these are demo traps, categories, whatever they they roll in is, and the message. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, somewhat useful. It's it's better than having to go to to go through log files. However, it's not. It's not inherently like useful right off the like right right apparently, uh, but um, there are these things called conditions, which here I have like um, Hispaniola, Helvetica. We'll just see what what these even mean. Um, and th this is just basically th these are just like MySQL queries basically. Um, so it's just going to that that's just the name for, for what it's going to re be referred to as. Um, and this is how many times that it that it's that this actual um, SNMP condition has been triggered, um, and this is what the actual S like what the actual query it's running on the database is, where the host name c column contains dot five four. I don't I don't know if you guys can read that. I'm I'm sorry. Um, so that's and that's basically all it's doing. Um, and so if we just click on apply this filter, it'll show us. It'll it'll dump us back. And then it'll just show us the ones where the host name contains dot five four. So all we're going to see are are ones where the host name column contains dot five four. Let's see here. Okay. Um, and then you, you can also add like uh, like quick ones. So instead of having to have ones named, like you just kind of want to see where the format line. Contains, let's see, doggone, which I'm sure most people's format lines contain doggone in most of them. Um, it'll just filter it by that. Now this is all, this is all well, well and go. Oh, and I'll just quick cover the, the trap actions. Um, if we go over here, we can just select them and we can just go to um, delete, and this will delete them. There's also um, archive them and mark as read. Um, mark as red is something um, I thought was kind of useful. Um, it was in it was in Nag trap. It was in NSTI 1.0 release. But um, you know, if it's it's it, it seems useful. And then the archive actually moves them to a different table. So if we click on archive and then click go, that actually moves them to a different table. So if we go up here into traps, there's there's actually three different tables. There's the there's the normal table, which is ones where um, SNMP had the OID for it. And it knew what it was, so it could translate all of this, all of this information: the category, severity, message, event name. Um, but sometimes, and this is a trouble. Th this is um, a problem with the, with newer users to SNMPTT. Like sometimes they don't bring the OIDs in for their device, so they get relegated to the unknown um, table. And I don't believe there's anything in here. Um, but no. But if if SNMP did, doesn't know or doesn't have an OID, it will show up. Uh, in here, so you will be able to just check and make sure your OID, your MIBs are installed properly, rather. Uh, but back to what I was actually talking about, um, the archives. Oh, I thought I archived those traps. Well, I didn't have any. That would that would be a problem, wouldn't it? Thank you. Uh, so if we go here, we just collect select a whole bunch of them, and go to archive. Now that should move them, and, and it actually moves them. Like it takes them out of this table, and then it moves them to a different table. And so then, if we go to traps and then to archives, um, now they're here. Okay, well that that, that was kind of nice. So it was proof that it actually did move them. And now um, these are here. You can kind of do whatever you want with them, delete them at your own will. But it's just kind of nice for setting them aside. Like if you need someone to see something and you don't want to have to keep the page open or take a screenshot or something, just kind of put them in the archive table just to prove something happened. 
Now the big question is, how does this integrate with Nagios? Um, well hey, Nick, I hate to interrupt you. Just want to give you a heads up, 10 minute mark right now. Awesome, cool, thanks. Um, so I'm just going to quick cover um, how it integrates with Nagios. If you guys have any questions, just interrupt me. It's just like being at home, so don't worry about it. Um, now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here, um, and this is something, th th this is, it, it is on my, my to-do list to make it so that you don't have to dig through an admin, admin menu um, for this stuff. Like I started moving the conditions over to here, but um, what I've got built in right now is actually uh, shell commands that, that it'll run. Um, and if we look, actually look at the conditions, like this, uh, this Hispaniola condition that we were using um, has a, like it's got a name and it's got an action that the, that's associated with it and this action that's associated with it is log this. So there's an actual, um, there's an NSTI daemon that, that's running in the background that's actually looking um, at all the traps that are coming in and if they, um, if they meet the specifications that Hispaniola sets, it will run the action log this. Um, so once again, I mean, if like this is what the actual Hispaniola condition is, if the host name contains dot five four, it'll run log this. Now, what exactly is log this? If we go into shell commands, we've got a bunch or some that are already defined. Um, now, apologize for the lack of, of fill, but this is my dev box. Um, and if we click on log this, what log this does is it's going to run um, this log this shell file, which is not conspicuously put placed at all <laughs> in, the, in the temp directory, um, and then it's just going to run it with an argument string. And right now, the, this isn't much of an argument string. It's just going to run this, and then it's going to break this up and it's going to fill in format line is with what, whatever, like, the format line corresponds to the message. Agent IP is, like, the host name. Um, and it'll run this with, with all of those, with them, with the actual trap, like, column values. And um, let's see. And that's, and so then how, how the, in a, the Nagios integration would happen is with a shell command like this where you would have a shell command and you would like a, like a send NSCA shell command or a send NRDP shell command or just write this to the Nagios pipe if this is on your actual Nagios box um, with, uh, with, with given, you know, dash H is something hard coded or dash H could be whatever the agent IP that sent the trap was. Um, and that is largely what I've got for actual Nagios integration. I'd like it to be slicker. It's on my, it's, it's my to-do list, but that is the current state of NSTI. Um, so I, I know we're kind of running low on time, but now I'll just make it so that you don't have to interrupt if you want to ask a question. So we got any questions? doing a lot with traps and um, what happens um, when if you're sending uh, let's say you want a trap on a host that goes down simple simple thing or maybe a network interface that goes down on a host um, when you send that do you have to would you have your uh, NSCA or NRDP check on every host you've got and that would go critical um you could do that or um uh, let, let me just quickly go back here and see if this is going to answer your question. Um, this is a good point, and this would actually be a good feature. Now, now I'm kind of realizing the scope of, of your question. This uh, th this actual host name here is something that like you, you could put in. Like um, back back where I have. Let's see if I if they're going to let me go back or forward. No, they're not going to let me go back. So just this th th this thing right here, th this host name. I don't know if this is the actual host that you'd have it specified in Nagios. But to get everything to flow well together, that, that, that's the way it would have to be. Um, and then if we go back to our action, and my, hello mouse, where did you go? There we go. We go to admin root, and then shell commands, and then our send nrdp. So we'd have our send nrdp, 
and then um, this, this dash H would be agent IP, which is actually a, a hidden, hidden column on there, but we can change that to uh, the actual host name. So then it would actually run send to NRDP with the dash H, so the host would be, would the, the, ar the argument for host would change to whatever the host name column name was. So I don't know if that really addresses what, what your question was, but this would avoid the hard coding for every single one that you had. Right, and that, that's what you would want to do. And um, I mean, you don't want like one check that just says some host went down um, because you, could have, you can have them overlaying each other and, and that turns into a mess. The problem we've run into here is uh, virtual IPs and uh, Windows machines where the host name, Windows host name is one thing that the <laughs> trap comes from but what it's in DNS with a different name and they don't match. And so you, you, we've needed some way to allow a host to have multiple names okay. uh, for a single host because the traps might come in with a different name. Okay. Um, uh, c c can we talk after, uh, after this and then, cause, all right, all right, cool. All right, we got about three minutes. Any additional questions? I had a question about uh, one of the problems we were running into with SNMP TT uh, is the trap came in. It's a really big trap. Um, it's probably uh, it's over a thousand characters. Nice. Um, I don't know how to handle those quite yet. Um, well, what did you do to to work with that? Um, so, uh, like, does the format line contain the, all of those characters, or is it? It, it contained more OIDs in the the line. Ah, it's one strings. of those. Yeah. That's, that's actually something that I've been thinking about how to, how to deal with because the SNMP traps can contain additional data that is like signifiable by that. And that's actually something that SNMP TT can do in the, um, in the SNMP TT conf that, that, that you have uh, for it, but it's not available in NSTI. And I'm, I am really, I mean, I've been I've been racking my brains on how to deal with that in a straightforward manner in a web interface, but yeah, that's but that's that's something that's like on my to tackle list, but yeah, that, that there's no straightforward way to do that short of the uh, like a comp file for it. Any other additional questions? Did he razzle dazzle you guys? Did he wow yeah, you guys? Yeah, yeah. I told you you'd only need the end of the seat. Put your hands together for Nick one more time, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot for listening, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. And St. Paul. I mean, you're here, so. <laughs>